to a pretty good uh, estimate of you know, city water temperature coming into the building. So that's just kind of a useful uh, rule of thumb number to use when you're starting just a you know, preliminary precursory energy out of the building. So then what you're left with, you stacked all these uh, kind of fixed loads, we'll call them up in the building, and you have uh, heating and cooling. And you just kind of graphically, you know, visually, take a pick of your split on that. 80% heating, 20% cooling. So now you've baselined your building without spending a whole lot of time at all. And um, you add it all up, and interior lighting's about 40% in this building. Plug loads are about 20%. You know, a lot of heating loads we saw in the building history when we first looked at it. And uh, so we kind of want to make sure that this is reasonable. And um, so let's go compare it to some things. What, what, what's out there that we can compare this to to know if we have a reasonable reasonable number? CBEX. CBEX. Right on. So. Uh, so CBEX data is a little bit, uh, little bit dated. Uh, the 2000 study had some issues, and um, you know, we're still kind of waiting for some additional data to come out. But you know, the federal government provides this, uh, this information on um, commercial building energy use. And then it gets split up by climate zones, uh, census zones. And so you're probably not going to find an exact match. You're probably not going to find a public published energy usage for a 40,000 square foot electric, all electric office building in Seattle. But you can triangulate in, uh, just pull from various uh, various publications and see what, uh, see kind of where the numbers are coming from. Uh, Ashray Pocket Handbook, there's an old version that had some numbers in there. And uh, you know, it has 7.3 to 88. So that was not really, not really that's quite a, quite a range, so probably not uh, really useful data there. Uh, we had a uh, Pacific uh, Northwest region building study that was done by some of the utilities a while back. You know, so there's a number there. If you kind of dig around the web and ask around, you can find some resources to, to check your count against. Did I say that correctly, that it compares, um, like it puts Washington and California in the same bracket? Yes. Okay. Yeah, when it's divided up by census region, that really gets to be a, even Western Washington. Because that's a completely Washington different energy use. Yeah. So that's, an, okay. Yeah, so you kind of have to look at that. Yeah. And, and one thing it does, uh, you can you can look at some data, and it will have some, some disaggregated end use. So it'll tell you heating load and cooling load yeah. and lighting. Right. And so you can probably grab lighting that's safe. It's pretty much consistent anywhere in the country. Right. Um, but the, uh, you know, the heating and cooling are going to want to discount that data if it's if it's grouped into a whole west coast census region. Yeah. Exactly. NIA's uh, commercial building stock assessment. I don't. How accurate is that compared to NIA? Uh, you know, for use here, it, it's much more accurate. And um, we've got, I don't know if it's available on our website, but with our existing building commissioning program, we pulled together a lot of information out of the uh, commercial building stock assessment that NIA Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance prepared a few years ago. And uh, if you want that information, I, I can get it to you if you send me an email. Are these values like the EUI pretty much? Yeah, that's exactly what this is. Energy use in this is energy use per square foot per year. So here's our example we did. Um, this is the old Pacific Northwest Regional Study. Uh, here's CBEX data uh, for an office building. So you know what you want to do is just kind of check your counts with other sources, and you know it looks pretty well balanced. Uh, for some reason, this one had a lot of exterior lighting in it. Um, just kind of makes you wonder about that sample and what they pull from. But you know, that that reality check is always important. Always be thinking about just do the numbers I'm coming up with make sense. And um, so that's an example of just how to do, to do a quick benchmark on a building. Yes. Um, does your um does PSI, um, your company actually have any kind of rebates as far as LED lighting is concerned? Yeah, we do. So what I'm seeing here immediately is that uh, interior lighting is a huge mm -hmm. jump. I mean, even more than heating and cooling, which kind of surprises me. Yeah, so you know, this this example came up, interior lighting is, it's a bigger chunk than, than what heating is in that building. So it definitely looks like it's game for a, for a lighting retrofit. And, um, yeah, simple. 
Is yeah. this based off of older buildings? Or um, this was this was actually a, you know I, I sent as an example of forty thousand square foot. I, I pulled an actual building somewhere in our service area when I pulled that together, and um, you know it was actual energy usage data that came out of the building. The lighting power densities and stuff. I didn't go do an odd of the building and they're preparing this presentation, so I um, um, don't know actually what the lighting power density was in that building. But this is something that we apply quite frequently when our engineers are out on site doing consultations with customers, kind of that first pass look. We always review the building history, and you can know a lot about the building before you ever walk in the front door, just by looking at load profiles and, and energy usage and just some basic facts. So that's a commercial uh, office building. I had a how are we doing on time? Are we, do we need to wrap up right at noon, or can we go a little long? Or? Uh, we got about 25 minutes until the pizza comes. Pizza usually comes around noon. Okay. So it's you coming 15 to, minutes late today. You guys have been great. You've been asking a lot of questions, and we've had a, a, had a conversation. And like I said, I've got more than an hour of here. But you know, as long as you're interested, I'll, I'll keep talking. Right. I'm not bored. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is a, uh, another example I did. This was um, this is a project that was really fun. This was a manufacturing facility. And um, we uh, had a lighting project proposed there. And what I wanted to do was get this customer to think about more than just lighting. And um, he kind of had to figure out what it was a manufacturing process. He had some, the equipment was uh, all electric uh, equipment with a lot of resistance heating. And he had a big compressed air system. And I, I sensed there was probably a good opportunity there he was really interested in this lighting. So what we did is put him on our uh, energy interval service so we could watch 15 minute uh, interval data electric usage in the building. And it's a two shift operation. He ran Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday, uh, I ran kind of a limited production, uh, one shift in the morning. And you can see that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Looks like they might go home a little early on Friday. And then uh, they uh, you know, run a little bit on Saturday. And this is uh, just taking one of these days and stretching it out a bit to look at it in detail. And then what we're going to do is start to figure out what's, what, uh, what makes up the energy use in this facility. And the first thing I notice is you're about 100 kW even overnight. But nobody's there and they're not running. So the first thing I, I notice is there might be something you can do overnight uh, to reduce some of your energy usage. And this was the, uh, we, we had added up all the lighting and, and done a study on that he was interested in replacing that. And, you know, we knew about how much was left on, a little bit of security lighting overnight throughout the course of the day. But you can see lighting is, when we get to that pie chart, lighting is not going to be his big opportunity for uh, energy savings in this building. And then we uh, went around and, and did a little bit of uh, just uh, instantaneous uh, power readings off of some of his other equipment and took nameplate data and you know, added that up and came to the conclusion that he doesn't have more than about 25 kW of other miscellaneous equipment that's being used uh, in the plant. So then what's left is a compressed air system and then these uh, manufacturing, these uh, presses that he has. And uh, we kind of need to figure out what's, what's the best opportunity between these two. He shuts his compressed air system down at night, so it's looking like these, this process heating equipment is, is going to be the big opportunity. Okay. Yeah, so it basically in the building because the equipment is heating it up, or is that? Yeah, the, the building actually has no cooling. Uh, it just has some exhaust fans. Uh, the, the people that work in there wear shorts and t-shirts. And uh, this is just really, there's a lot of, he, he's making a product where you press high pressure and temperature, fuses a product and forms a product. And but why overnight is that drawing up? Um, and so really what we found out on this, um, they were concerned about peak demand. And they were concerned that if they turned all this equipment on at 4 a.m. to warm it up, to be ready for production when they started up at 6, that um, they would set their peak demand uh, in the morning. And it would go higher than what it typically occurred during the day, just warming all that cold equipment up. So they left it on all the time. And uh, they had a lot of concerns about that. So the first thing, uh, first thing I said was, well, why don't we turn some of it off? So you had 25 of these machines. So we turned five of them off on a Friday night. And then he turned them back on on a Saturday morning. And what this chart doesn't show is you know, his, his peak demand whenever these came back on, but it really didn't make a big difference. So that was one, the first thing we learned is you can go ahead and shut some of this stuff down at night because it's not going to set your, your 
demand billing charge for the month, warming them up in the morning. You're using more energy running the process than you actually are using uh, to warm the equipment up. So we turned five to 25 off, and we saw a 16 kW drop, pretty much average in, in, in load overnight. And so now we know that uh, Five machines, that's about 3.2 kW each of these machines is pulling to uh, just to stay warm. And then we, we watched uh, first ship production, second ship production. They did change over and run a different product, uh, second ship. And uh, just kind of looked at an average of um, kW. And this is uh, actually data logging on one specific machine. So we put a logger on, a true kW logger, and watched the machine run. For several days. What, what kind of what kind of logger did you use? Uh, this is a Dent Elite Pro. Okay. And um, so we saw about 90 kW first shift, 71 kW second shift. So now we know, you know, we'll, well, they're pretty much running consistently across all of these machines. So at times 25 machines, we have kW use, instantaneous kW use, uh, given the shift average. And so we now we know what what the uh, energy use of the process. Heat we know what it's pulling at night. We measured it during the day. And uh, we'll just say everything else is compressed air, because that's pretty much what's left in the plant. And then it's kind of a, you know blocked off here, so we'll, we, we see that they kind of shut down gradually in the evening. So that's we'll call that our load profile uh, for the plant. And then you can put that in a high chart and you see process heating, compressed air, lighting. It's like, yeah, you've got a cost-effective lighting retrofit project. You know, we can go ahead and do that. Now let's start looking into the uh, compressed air system opportunities to make it more efficient. Let's think about shutting that process heating and equipment down at night, since we found out that uh, it isn't a big penalty on your demand charge to warm that up in the mornings. And uh, then start thinking about some other things we can do to maybe make that equipment more efficient. So that, uh, that's just another example of how you don't have to spend uh, you know, a lot of expense and effort to baseline a building. So we use interval data and logged one machine for a week, and, and that was that got us to, to this answer. How long did the study take over? Um, a couple of weeks. You know, we turned the interval data on, uh, just let it go for a week or so, and then I checked back in after, after we got a little bit of historical data there. I uh, went back on site, did the data logging, and so it was probably a, a course of a month from the time this person called with, hey, I think I want to do a lighting retrofit. So, um, yeah, we can do lighting, but there's, Here's some other things you might want to consider. So is this like a consulting service that you got to provide to building owners at Puget Sound Energy to come in and do this kind of thing? Um, we really don't provide. So the question is, is this a consulting service we provide? Yeah, is this something you like? And we uh, we don't really provide consulting services, but we have our engineers that work on grant projects. And so really the way you get started working with us is somebody sends in a project application. And so in this case, it was a lighting project. Hey, we've got a proposal from a contractor that wants to retrofit our lighting. Here's uh, here's the cost. What kind of a rebate or grant incentive could we get for the lighting retrofit? So then, when when I'm on site, you know, you, we are always kind of looking for that next opportunity. We want to educate people, make sure they're aware of other opportunities they have for energy efficiency. And we're just kind of making the sell for the next project. And then, you know, really the you know, the next step from this was, you know, how do I uh, how do I get my uh, load control center? set up and do automated switching to turn my machines off at night and on in the morning so I don't have to rely on somebody manually to do that or have somebody come in two hours early in the middle of the night to turn stuff on and, and warm it up. And you know that's that's the consultant service. He needs to find somebody to help help him design that and, and implement that. And we'll be there again with a, with an incentive because there are going to be very good energy you know, savings from that. Can, can you, one, of the, one of the things we're doing here is we're the, our environmental technology group and our BIT group are starting to work together around energy data collection projects and things like that. Can you just really quickly kind of go, it sounds like you, you used some historical even you know, EUIs and things like that, and then you went to metering data, and then you went to some like deployable instrumentation. Yeah. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of how that goes down and how, how is that important to you? Or just help yeah, us you understand know, it's it. really what, what, what it is and kind of what I was, you know, this is a full some slides out of this presentation, but really the point I was, I was making it and presenting this was, you know, use, what, use whatever you have at your fingertips. Whatever is, is most readily available and cheapest, cheapest information to grab and then um, I'll show you a couple more slides. So this data logging doesn't have to be expensive. 
Right. This is, I'm embarrassed to admit, this is the way I did it when I was in graduate school one time. This is <laughs> extremely dangerous, so yeah. don't, don't do that. that. <laughs> don't do it that way. Yeah, students um, don't look. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, there are a lot of low cost, uh, you know, like hobo loggers, yeah, to have a, a light, a photocell sensor for lights, or a motor just on or off. You know, where you don't even have to open an electrical panel or anything to do to do metering. And then the other thing, talking about the, you know, the, the building information systems and the control systems, you know, the next slide I have here is, if you've got a DVC system in a building, you usually those have a capability to set up a trend log. And you know, that's, that's your cheapest opportunity to really get a good handle on um, how energy is being used by equipment. Either just pulling scheduling of equipment, Sometimes you want to make sure you might want to do a, do a site visit and go into a mechanical room after hours and see that the equipment really did shut down when the DDC system had it scheduled off. And you know, the, it's not in hand mode in the mechanical room instead of auto. So those are the kinds of things you want to look for. Um, but it's really, it's about you know, grabbing uh, whatever information is readily available. And, you know, there's no one type of approach. You know, depending on what information you have at your fingertips, Pull that together or triangulate in on uh, you know, getting some perspective of energy use in the building. Are these more like target audits or do they get to like a level three audit where you're being really extensive about you know, um, you know really what, uh, what we do is you know as the utility company offering energy efficiency incentives, you know, we definitely don't want to be viewed as a competition with engineering consulting firms and energy service providers. So, you know, we're not going to give the, the detailed energy audits and the scoping out and help people uh, identify, you know, comprehensive energy management plans and, and capital projects. Usually what we're doing when we're on site is we've had some proposal for some kind of project um, that we're evaluating, doing our due diligence, you know, developing our comfort that we will get these savings if we invest in this project and provide funding for the project. And then um, in our free time, you know, if we have an opportunity to, to advise and offer some guidance on other opportunities, we definitely do that. And lots of times we may do a quick check, uh, like the ones I've talked to, just to kind of a reality check. So sometimes we get submitted a, a very detailed building energy simulation, and we've got that question, is this been properly calibrated? You know, has the engineer that has assembled this documentation of energy savings, have they done the, the, uh, the post-it note back to the envelope calcs? Just to make sure that what they're what they're calculating is uh, is reasonable. So lots of times we'll do this kind of analysis just as a reality check on um, on a proposal that we've been given, you know, where where a customer is wanting us to provide funding for a project. Um, you know, like I said, always talk to the people that know the operation. Um, you know, your facilities maintenance folks, uh, you know, contractors that have worked on site, uh, your facilities management directors. That first pass, keep the big picture. Don't get into the weeds. Don't get into the situation where you can't see the forest for the trees. Um, so that's uh, that's the presentation I gave. Hopefully that was uh, useful and, and gave you some, some good ideas and maybe some new ways to, to think about approaching energy analysis in a building. Just, I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, useful tools at your fingertips on the World Wide Web. You know, there's definitely you know, the utility company websites, they pretty much ever, everyone around here has some level of energy efficiency program offerings. Um, just get on those and dig around, and you'll find a lot of helpful tools and information on how to do uh, energy analysis. Um, have you heard of the uh, Desire website? Be careful when you Google. <laughs> and, um, Sometimes I even have a hard time getting through the filter to get to this one in the office. But, um, yeah, this is a, it's a national database put together by the uh, Department of Energy and some other organizations. It lists by state all the utility companies and incentive programs that they offer. So very useful tool just to find out what's out there and to make your way to other utility company uh, websites on energy efficiency. Uh, Consortium for Energy Efficiency. Uh, this is an organization that uh, PSE is a member of, and it's, it's, it's really a good organization. They set um, a lot of the ENERGY STAR appliances, anything that's got that label. This group has set the requirements around the efficiency uh, needed 
to qualify um, to be Energy Star. So, for example, on the commercial side, on packaged rooftop equipment, you'll hear of a CEE Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 efficiency requirements. This group has set up the, uh, you know, how efficient, what, what does your SEER or EER rating need to be on a piece of equipment to qualify uh, for a various tier, and then Energy Star will come along and say, all right, CEE Tier 1 is eligible for the Energy Star label. Of course, U.S. Department of Energy. There's there's a lot of stuff on their website. You know, there's a here's an action plan template for for doing an audit on the building, the HVAC system. And then um, our neighbors to the north. There's a lot of good uh, good information as well with Natural Resources Canada. As long as you don't mind converting from SI to English units, uh, sometimes it, you have to do a little bit of conversion to use some of their tools. But they have they have good tools as well. Then um, you know all the various uh, professional organizations, ASHRAE, uh, this, this is the group that, that I'm a big, you know, I'm part of, and really have identified that as being my uh, my professional society. And uh, just uh, you know, Dave Ray said that uh, you're going to be doing some some work around dedicated outdoor air systems uh, coming up. They've got a, uh, a free webinar on April 19th uh, from 1 to 4 Eastern time uh, on dedicated outdoor air systems. Might be something good to, to participate in if you're if you're not planning to do that. Do you have to be a member of Ashray to do that? Um, I don't think you have to be a member. I think you just it's free Ashray webcast. I think uh, you can sign up and view it as a group or on your own, and um, there should be some good information there. That was uh, uh one to four. That's one to one to four Eastern. Ten to one here. And that's just through the Ashray website. Or? Yeah, so if you go to ashray.org, and uh, you'll you'll probably see an advertisement right when you land on their you know, their main landing page. So this was my uh, kind of second part of the presentation: how you know, how to care about energy efficiency. Yeah. Can I sorry? I can, can oh, I ask sorry. you a little bit about your engagement model? So. It sounds like there's like contractors that kind of make proposals to you to see if you're going to help them, you know, help carry some of the, the nut around around financing the project. Yeah. That's kind of what's yeah. going on. And so, with places for our students, I mean, if uh, if those contractors approach you with a package that's kind of at least it's already started, or they've done their own state work, does that seem more attractive to you? Or yeah, you, you, yeah. I, um, so we have we have rebates and grants. Right. And I think to to the outside world, to the customer, everybody refers to it as a rebate. We do something and you write us a check. Um, but we have, the way we distinguish those in, in our programs, you know, a rebate is a standard prescriptive measure. And I've got a, a presentation on that too that I'll, I'll go over really quickly, but that's pretty much, um, you, know, you put a BFD on a pump. We'll give you so many dollars per driven horsepower of that pump. And you know, we've done some analysis and we know generally a BFD saves about this much per horsepower. and um, all you have to do is fill out the application, send it in, get pre-approved. Yes, this is an appropriate application. You're an eligible PSC customer. Okay. Install it, send us the invoice, and we'll write you a check. Okay. When we work on the grant side, that's where that's pretty much we're interested in anything that provides cost-effective energy savings. And that's where we have uh, we've got about 20 engineers that uh, provide custom grants. And uh, it's a simple one-page application. I can show you that in the presentation. And uh, <coughs> send that in with your idea. And lots of times it may be a McKinstry or McDonald Miller or University Mechanical, ESCO, they've done the analysis. They've worked with the customer to develop this whole strategic plan of investments around energy efficiency.